the mats of radical MMA in New York City. The Martial Culture Podcast. Your source for in-depth combat sports and martial arts insights with, with Coach, Coach Renee Dreyfus and, and Matt Peters. Peters. Ring the bell and let's, let's get, get it on. on. Renee, we're back again. Two weeks in a row. It's a record. We are back. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing fantastic and super, super psyched. Yes. I am so honored to introduce to our listeners a person who cha- personally changed my life uh, more than many other martial artists. I really owe my decision to move into Gracie Jiu-Jitsu to this human being who kicked the crap out of me way back when in 1993 in Tokyo. <laughs> way, way back. Yeah, I'd like to introduce you to a person who is an amazing martial artist, an amazing author, also uh, served our country very well um, in the in CIA, uh, Mr. Barry Eisler, and uh, and welcome and thank you so much for being on our on the Martial Culture Podcast. Oh, Renee, it's it's a pleasure and it's my honor. Thank you for the very kind words. Yes. So one of the reasons we have you back is because, guys, uh, uh, Barry has a lot of wonderful novels, but his latest novel, The Killer Collective, is coming out, and I would like to talk that uh, uh, talk about that later. But first. Um, I would like to introduce you guys why this person is so special to me. So I started martial arts at a young age, uh, moved to Japan, started training martial arts in Japan. And I, would, oh, I had been doing some judo, but, you know, I walked into the Kodokan and I was very green. You know, I'd been doing judo, you know, on and off for some time, but, but you know, it was really green in the Kodokan, came in. And, you know, we walked into the foreigners division because back then all the white guys were put in the foreigners division. And I just got moshed. And there was this guy who came over to me and said, let me show you how it's done. And he's like, hey, I'm like, did you do judo? And he's like, no, I actually did Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. I'm like, what's that? And I heard about that Black Belt magazine. And he's like, well, we focus on groundwork. And I'm like, but, you know, all right, all right. And then he's like, let's spar. And I turned into a human pretzel for about 25 minutes. <laughs> mm-hmm destroyed me in the nicest possible way. First of all, to me, you embody a martial artist because you are so humble and so genuine and so nice and so about reality. And that put me on that path of like, let's search out reality. And unfortunately, you know, I got injured, but when a minute I came back to America and I was healed, you know, I walked into the Machado uh, camp and uh, started training there and I was always inspired. And you have always been my, my, uh, my, my guiding star. Uh, reality, hard work, uh, no excuses and and you know f- focusing on the data and f- personally I want to always thank you for the massive impact you had on my life I, I would not be the martial artist I am today without you and I, I seriously mean that Renee I'm so honored to hear you say this thank you oh, I can't believe there was a time I had anything to teach you about <laughs> grappling or the martial arts generally this was <laughs> for anyone who's listening this was in 1993 1994 so it was a quarter century ago, which sounds about right because my my knowledge of grappling and martial arts is at this point a tiny subset of yours. And it is such a pleasure for me to see what you've done with your life and all your skill, uh, the way you've become a teacher. I mean, I know I showed you a few things and and maybe in some ways opened your eyes to the importance of grappling as, as something that a, a complete martial artist should know how to do. But oh my God, did you pick that up and run with it to places um, very few people have gotten to. Congratulations on everything you've achieved. Achieved. Well, thank thank you. I'm I'm just I'm just a humble student, and that's really you know as I said, you there's a few people in my life, my old karate sensei, Mr. Miyazaki. Uh, I remember you remember Steve. We used to train with Steve Blower. Yes, Steve Blower. Yeah, yeah. We're still in touch. He's a great judo master, and and yeah. and I have a few other you know Hirata sensei. You know, there's certain sure. people in my life who had a tremendous m- moment, and you, we share those people. So, uh, you know, we, we had these wonderful times, January 1992 in the Kodokan, and, uh, and we went on from there. And uh, it, just, it was a wonderful time back then where people didn't really get how important submission fighting was, but we got it. And, yeah. and, I, and, and it, we just ran. And then the UFC came out, and it just exploded. Yeah, and, it was right around that time, actually. Yeah, I yeah, mean, the yeah. UFC started in 1993, I think. September, yes, yeah, September, November, November 1993, right. Okay. Okay. And wow. uh, yeah, but uh, could you go into your background a little bit in, in first, uh, obviously you served our country a little bit, but then you also have more your martial art background and then how sure. we could talk about your books as well and things like that. So my interest in martial arts comes primarily from my experience of being bullied when I was a kid, which uh, I think like almost anyone who's ever been bullied, I really hated. And I'm glad to say that the lesson I learned from it wasn't that, oh, you want to get strong so that you can be a bully too. 
It was, I want to get strong so that nobody can bully me and so that I can protect people who are bullying. I think those are, who are being bullied. Those are the right lessons to learn if you've ever had to deal with bullies. So uh, my first experience with martial arts was when I got into wrestling when I was a sophomore in high school. And I'm actually proud of this because this is, oh, 1980. And I think I was a little ahead of the curve in recognizing that wrestling is a terrific martial art. It's primarily, or especially at the time, was primarily understood as a sport right, in right. America, which it also is, obviously. But wrestling has amazing martial arts and self-defense applications. So that was my primary interest. I thought, God, these wrestlers, they're really tough. I wouldn't want to have to get in a fight with one of them. Oh, I should learn how to do that. So I did. And then when I was in college, I met a couple of um, guys from Japan who were, I was, at, I was an undergrad at Cornell. They were in the Cornell Business School. They were both fourth Don from the Kodokan. Oh, no kidding. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember their names. But, uh, and I don't even remember how we met. I remember it was at the gym, so I must have just been working out. We got to talking, and I mentioned that I had some, that I was a high school wrestler. And they were interested in Western wrestling, and I was interested in, uh, in judo and Asian martial arts generally. So we just started playing around a little bit, and I would show them some wrestling things, and they showed me some judo things. And I quickly realized that, wow, judo has uh, a whole range of applications that Western wrestling doesn't, chiefly things like, well, submission holds, strangles, and uh, arm bars. So then I started doing judo. I got into karate. and uh, Oh, what style was, of karate did you do? Okay, give me a second because this has been so long. <laughs> uh, not, not Shotokan. It was, uh, I want to say Shotoryu. Sh sh Shitoryu, yeah, Shitoryu. Thank you, Shitoryu. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it was a big gym class. Interesting enough, with... Shitoryu is, is an amalgam of Japanese jiu-jitsu and karate, uh, and, and, and Okinawan karate, but, but, so okay, it has, okay, a, has some karate. grappling uh, roots in it as well. So that's my recollection, mm -hmm. and this we can, at any time... I'm always happy to branch out because martial arts self-defense, those are topics that interest me a lot. Different people have different opinions about them. This is what I would say uh, at a fairly high level of generality is this. I'm less interested in, oh, I do this style of martial art or that style, and more interested in the how is it? How do you train? Yeah. What kind of training do you do? Because I don't care what style it is. Is if you if you don't train in a certain way, my my personal primary interest in martial arts has always been self defense. That's a, a result of that experience of being bullied, and that's not to say that there aren't lots of other absolutely valid reasons to study martial arts. It can be a form of discipline, a form of exercise, uh, a way of practicing an ancient, uh, let's say in this tradition. case, if we're talking about karate or whatever, an Asian tradition. Those are all valid absolutely valid reasons for studying martial arts, just like self-defense is a valid reason, but you will probably want to train in different ways depending on what your objectives are. And if you're training is self-defense, in my mind, that means, if your objective rather is self-defense, in my mind, that means you need to train in a certain way. So that gym class I was taking in Studio Karate was really interesting, but I sensed that I just didn't have the confidence that it had the real world self-defense applications that were my primary interest. So I wound up going downtown to this place called the Greater Ithaca Activity Center and learning to box. And that was a revelation to me because, again, I know a lot of people might not agree with this, and that's totally fine. I, I like these discussions. But I think you've got to train. I mean, there's no such thing as live. I mean, even, uh, even soldiers don't train in live combat with real bullets being shot at them. By, um, by like red teaming forces imitating the enemy. There has to be some safety element. But in all training that's uh, designed to prepare you for a real fight, you want to get as close to what an actual fight will be as you safely, cost-effectively can. can. Absolutely. That's the I, best I, kind of training. I, I think um, yeah. uh, there's a great quote from um, the SBG founder, uh, Will, Will, um, Matt, Matt, Matt Thornton, and he says, mm -hmm. it's not live, it's aliveness. And you, oh, that's the, nice. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's motion, uh, timing, and energy. Ex yeah. You know, and you're dealing with that. It doesn't have yeah. to be you know live bullets, but you're still having the maneuvers of the enemy in in military right. combat. And in, in boxing, you have this training, which is a non-resisting opponent. 
like you said, it's not the martial art. It's how you train because yeah. you can see that uh, – I'm very critical of the modern sports jiu-jitsu world right now because they're saying, yeah, oh, we're, no, so, we're so live. We're so this, this. I'm like, OK, you are going live, but you're going live in a way that is, is, is so – protected by certain rules so protected by right. this that it's it's there's a liveness okay for sure there's some but right. it's limited because you're restricting so many moves um, right. and there has to be a way to to balance safety with reality and that's always the the line that we have to cross as martial artists do we err mostly on safety and wind up in you know like um chinese push hands which is you know a great competition but very limited uh, application in combat, or you're, you know, full, full on Valley Tudo, or like they have now in Russia, which is like five on five Valley Tudo, <laughs> right. which I freaking love. <laughs> right. That's so. Yeah. That's the question. How do you do it uh, cost effectively? Bruce mm -hmm. Lee had a, an expression I like, which is the best preparation for the event is the event, and that's true. But you can only. But how do you get cost effectively as close to the event as possible so that you're ready for the event? Without actually having been killed or brutalized or broken down right, or whatever, right, right. brain damage, in the event. Uh, yeah, shoulder all these, surgery, all these yeah, potential yeah, problems. Yeah. So, just at the time, training I think has changed a lot since um, since I was wrestling in the '80s and doing some jujitsu in the very early '90s, and then Kodokan judo uh, and, and and boxing also in the '80s. But what instinctively appealed to me were the things that were more alive. So on the one hand, look, wrestling is like a, a real fight in some ways and unlike a real fight in other ways. For example, nobody's, uh, nobody's punching you, kicking you, or trying to scratch you or gouge your eyes out or whatever, like, you know, whatever level of intensity shading from a fight into combat you might imagine. There are definitely rules. Now, likewise for boxing. Um, you're, you're not allowed to grapple in boxing, and that's that's not like most uh, real fights where they're uh, certainly grappling is always going to be on the table. But what I liked about wrestling and boxing was you're dealing with an opponent who's trying to do everything to you as hard as he can that you're trying to do to him, and he's yeah. trying to defend as hard as he can from the things you're doing to him. That level of what uh, what you refer to as aliveness, I really like that. That really appealed to me because I felt like this isn't exactly like a fight, but it's close enough so that it, it prepares me better than the exclusively kata sort of things we were yeah. doing yeah. with uh, the Shitoryu college gym class that I had been playing around with. Right. So anyway, by the way, for anyone who's listening, this is not in any way a put down of traditional Asian martial arts, not at all. Uh, it's, it's more critique of training methods with uh, regard to certain objectives, because if your objective is to really learn to be able to fight, to be able to defend yourself, and even those are different things, fighting right, and self-defense, right. um, then I think you have to train a certain way, and that's much more important than the art itself. Absolutely, and you know, opinion. you know what another element is, which is why one reason people talk to MMA right now is being di dynamic in understanding how to train for mm -hmm. as much a real circumstance as possible. But mm -hmm. Dan and Asanto, which Bruce Lee student, said something really valuable. It says it also comes down to the protective gear you're using. So yeah. if you, you know, like yesterday, we were doing uh, an unarmed versus knife combat. So we're live mm -hmm. sparring. Now, most times they'll do with the magic marker or something like that. Or, you right. know, people go, oh, I'm going to train with a live blade, which is insane, and it actually doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work because people hold back. So how do you do this? So what we did is we use a shock knife, which is an electric yeah, taser yeah, I've knife. Yeah, I've heard great things right. about those. And we go – we put goggles on and we go 100 percent live and nobody gets hurt. But because of that right. technology, we are able to go really, really live and know – when you feel the pain and you you know right. that that you've gotten but but you can walk home and you're not hurt the same right. thing what makes jiu jitsu so great is the tap out uh, but also what makes muay thai or or boxing great is is, is the the addition of you know uh, certain protective gear that you can wear while you train so that you don't damage your body tremendously like you know i always wear knee pads it sounds weird but they're like oh when you shoot on the street you don't have knee pads yeah but at the same time i want to protect my knees just in <laughs> case smart. on the fifth shot i take a bad shot because i'm tired that day and i don't yeah. have to go get acl reconstruction <laughs> yes so so yeah, you know all good, it, all good examples yeah, make yeah. It cost effective I, I think your points are wonderfully valid and um and it, it just shows also you have a, a fantastic understanding of of how Real people train uh, to get to get 
uh, uh, effective in, in self-defense. And I, I don't know if you know, but you listen to a couple podcasts. I've actually quoted you because you have some really good understanding of, you know, the more reality-based approaches. I know you're very good friends with uh, um, a few pioneers in that space of uh, Vim, Vim – um, Demir, Win Demir. Win Demir. I wasn't sure yeah. exactly how to pronounce it, and uh, and you know those guys really understand how the anatomy of of a street fight, and what we try to do also is in my academy is simulate the 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 jump, you know, the like, oh, it's not we're shaking hands and let's go. It's like, okay, right. you know, the you know when I do the women's self defense, they might be drilling on the corner and I'll, I'll right. go over and while they think I'm going to just correct them, I just grab them and slam them to the wall, <laughs> grab yeah. their hair and put, you know, like you know, attack them when they weren't expecting it from behind, yeah, yeah. because that's how it happens, you know. And that's that, really that, that's really smart, <laughs> right? Because no, the, the 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 jump, and I know a few UFC level fighters, not not only UFC but MMA professionals who have not done well in street fights because the opponent was and facing them <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know so, that, so this is yeah. this is an important difference yeah. and again and in all things it's important to understand the similarities and the differences yeah mma is i mean i i, I couldn't i can't really fight in mma so i mean someone like you, you you take me apart it's um you know i have a few skills that are probably most of which are rusty anyway but but um in the sense that mma is like a real fight i'll, I'll do terribly in it but one way that's important to understand how MMA is not like a real fight is it's consensual. You yes. step in there, you're prepared. You've actually warmed up physically, emotionally, psychologically. You know there are rules that are there to protect you. These are important differences that people just need to be aware of. It doesn't mean MMA is bad. It doesn't mean it's good. It just means recognize the similarities and the differences so that you can be as prepared as possible for the real thing. Right, and I see MMA as a training tool to prepare yourself for real life, but it is not the not the only training tool. It is one training be. tool. Yeah, agreed. But but agreed. there are other training tools. Like like when I want to get in shape, I'll sometimes use dumbbells, or sometimes I'll use yoga, and or sometimes yeah. do this. There are all these tools, and together they make a cohesive, prepared, you know, martial warrior. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Nicely said. Totally agree. Oh, you want to approach you. the problem from different perspectives. And and by the way. Um, I think for anyone who's listening, one thing, it relates to this notion of uh, a match as being consensual. There are rules. It's Everyone's agreed to be there and to participate according to the rules. Uh, these things don't apply on the street. And, and one of the things that makes any kind of uh, street encounter so much different than any kind of match is the ambiguity. You don't know what's going to happen. And, and that really messes with your preparation. You'll get a huge adrenaline dump. I, I trained with a guy named Peyton Quinn quite a few years ago. Peyton used to run something called the Rocky Mountain Combat Applications Training Institute. And Peyton's whole philosophy was, if, if you're not training uh, in the presence of adrenalized stress, you're not really training. And this is to your point about why some MMA guys who have tremendous physical skills didn't necessarily do well in a real fight because in, unlike the, okay, the bell rings or, you know, let's get it on or whatever. And now we're going to go and I'm all warmed up. You're not doing whatever it is you're doing. It could be the grocery shopping, you're just out in the world. You're not thinking you're going to be in any kind of yeah. potentially violent encounter and something starts happening, but you're not sure yet. Right. It seems to be escalating. And then you're, you know, I don't want to get in trouble. I mean, there are legal problems, uh, all sorts of thoughts, go, unfamiliar thoughts going through your mind compared to the clarity of let's get it on and the bell rings. Right. That sort very, of thing. Very, very so true. you got to prepare for that. Oh, absolutely. That's, that is a wonderful point. And uh, this is – it was actually so so interesting because I was dealing with a concept like that in our self-defense classes. Like when, the, when you have to see the paradigm of escalation and you have right. to understand what it is and if people – if there's verbal uh, aggression, which is not physical – or, or what I call physical presence aggression, where the guy's eyeing you or something. That is yeah. a stage of of, of escalation. The, the first thing is make distance so that when you manage the distance, you manage the damage. Make distance if you can. If you can't, because you need to defend someone, you have to choose. Right. You have to choose. And this is one reason why I feel like some arts of control, like jujitsu, are really good because if yes. you turn the person into a human pretzel, then you <laughs> can expect what happens. That being said. 
you know, a fight is always chaotic, and you, you know, adaptability, chaos is it, 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 to chaos is is the most important element of of self defense, and it's not one martial art ever. It's it's always a variety of skills that you can bring to bear to adapt to that chaotic moment. But you're right, the leading up is so important, and and I, I actually had an experience like that. Um, I, I don't want to waste time, but it was like I was sitting at a bar counter ordering mm. uh, some some food for my lunch, yeah, and then yeah. before I know it. I'm looking at the menu. Before I know it, the guy is standing right next to me, and yes. I believe he had just gotten out of prison, and he had grabbed a steak knife and was going to stab me. And I was looking at a, at a menu, and I had yeah. no idea. And he, he flipped out because I took his seat. My yeah. friend saw it, pulled me out of the way, because I was mm-hmm. looking at a menu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like, like no, all training in the world would not have helped me there. And my yeah. friend pulled me away quickly. I made distance. I'm like, holy Jesus, that was you know, and then the guy's yeah. freaking out, and then I'm like, we made distance, and then that was that was it. And yeah. uh, but it was it was a situation where my awareness of the situation and my lack of understanding of the escalation, you know, trumped whatever advantage my training would have had. So, uh, you right. know, that that it's a very point. But let me just shift gears. And do you mind if we discuss your your time in in, in CIA? Yeah, whatever you like. Yeah. I, you know, I never knew that about you when we were friends. <laughs> uh, when did, Wasn't I, when did I come out about that, so yeah. to speak? Uh, it's when, well, okay, so to back up, uh, I I served in a covert position in the CIA from 1989 to 92, and it really, I don't want to make too much of it. Most of it was training. It was a really good, interesting experience. I'm glad I had, especially since uh, I wound up going on to make a living as a writer of political thrillers, certainly the the background in the CIA is helpful. But uh, but it's it's really not all that. Mostly it was training and uh, it's not like I, I participated in too many coups and assassinations and that's too, why I had to get many. out. There's nothing remotely not like too that. many. <laughs> so, <laughs> There's yeah, not some. Too many. No, not at all as it, as it happens. But, but it was a it was a really interesting. Yeah, actually, can I tell you one? I, I could tell you a lot Please. of funny CIA stories, but I'll just tell you one since it's a nice transition from martial arts. Uh, when I was when I was at the farm, I was there twice. Once was for the most fun I've ever been paid to have. This is a course. I don't know what these things are called now because this is uh, what it was. Oh my god, it was thirty years ago. That's completely mad. Right, and you were in the uh, director it, of operations, yeah. correct? Or I think that the yeah, name's changed right. now. But so yeah, now yeah. it's called the National Clandestine Service. Yeah. But at the time, yeah. it was called the Directorate of Operations. And that's when you think about spies, case officers. So that, that's what I was. That's what I trained to be. And uh, but everybody. Whether whether you're in uh, opera- the director of operations or directorate of intelligence, those are the analysts. Uh, directorate of science and technology, those are you know, the, the geek squad, the the guys who make gadgets and uh, that sort of thing. Or uh, I think it was called the directorate of administration. It's been a while. I'm forgetting, but but uh, logistics support. Regardless, if if you're a career trainee, a CT, which is what I was, everybody goes to the farm for at the time i think it was nine weeks maybe it was only seven it was changing they kept cutting it back but it was for something called the satsi the special operations training course paramilitary school so for seven or nine weeks i was paid albeit not that much but still to run around the woods uh blowing stuff up making improvised explosive devices learning to use a variety of weapons uh, fun stuff like an M79 grenade launcher, long arm, small arm, small watercraft, airdrops to friendly forces from from low flying airplanes. It was really, really fun. I'm glad I had that experience. <laughs> that sounds um, crazy. Anyway, the reason I bring it all up is because I got friendly with an instructor there, a former uh, force recon marine guy named Carl, big, uh, intimidated looking, in- intimidating looking guy, and we got to be quite friendly. So when I was back. And Carl was a black belt in Hapkido, also had some judo experience. Big dude. He was one of these really solid people. He's like maybe six feet, 210 pounds, just solid, naturally solid, really strong. And uh, when I was back at the farm again for what was called the Field Trade Craft, FTC, that's, that's Spike School. That's 20 weeks, everything you need to know to develop a main a clandestine relationship. So that's really spy school. And that was only the ops people who went to that course. But anyway, so I was back at the farm where, where Carl was, where Carl had been one of my paramilitary instruction instructors and we were friendly. So we used to spar and, um, we'd get together just in our own time in the gym. There were some mats and we'd, we'd roll around. And, uh, 
And one night we were sparring and Carl was much better than I was and typically they didn't have a hard time with me. But for whatever reason that night I was just having a really good night or he was having a bad one or both. And I was getting the better of him and at one point he got frustrated and went to do some sort of spinning back hook or fancy move. And it's like this is when everyone breaks their leg on the last run down the ski slope. They're like, oh, I'll just do one more, but you shouldn't. You're tired. It's already time to – it was just like that. Should have stopped already. We're really tired. My my hands were not up uh, where they should have been to protect my face. And as Carl went into his spinning back fist, I was stepping in for my own punch. Oh. And he caught me perfectly in the nose with his elbow, like a spinning back elbow <laughs> into the nose. <laughs> I still have photographs of what this did to my nose. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think it, but your nose is not as fixed in place as you might think. <laughs> and it's, it was unbelievable. I mean, he just moved my nose all the way over to my cheek. It was still attached to the top and bottom <laughs> as usual. The whole middle it became an L shape. It was unbelievable. So I still remember this. It was interesting. Uh, I saw the proverbial big white flash of light, like what happens when you get hit in the head. Um, you know, boom. And I stepped back and I said, hang on, hang on a second. And, and, uh, I said, I'm okay. Hold on. And Carl says, Barry, you're not okay. Sit down. And at that instant, blood just started gushing out of my face, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like gushing. And I said, oh man. And I got scared for a second because I'd, I'd never seen that much blood ever, certainly not coming out of my face. And for one second I thought, oh man, this is bad. And I remember thinking in that instant, I thought, dude, calm down. If you, if you get excited, it's just going to make it worse. Just relax. And, uh, and I was really, I'm proud of that now that I had the presence of mind to think, you want to get your heart rate up as blood's pumping out of your body just try to calm down <laughs> relax so i sat down it was okay uh the blood slowed after a, a minute or so carl took me to the emergency room and this is in williamsburg where uh the farm camp area is located and the doctor who was attending to my broken nose <laughs> was uh was saying uh so what are you guys what kind of training are you doing up there and uh, and carl uh former Texan, former Marine says, that's classified. I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> And so of course so we're laughing about this, but afterwards I realized this is how legends get started because this was just a stupid accident. It wasn't even training. It was two like overgrown boys, you know, wrestling around and they did a dumb thing. And one of them got hurt and had to go to the emergency room. It had nothing to do with CIA training. Not really. I mean, it was on our own time. Um, but this guy will tell anyone he knows. He's like, Oh man, but the, you know, you got to understand the CIA trains those people really hard. It's intense. They brought one guy in, his nose was totally messed up. It was all the way on the side of his head. And the scary guy brought him in and he told me he'd have to kill me. <laughs> so you're saying and, you're the reason that expression exists. <laughs> <laughs> They're telling that story for all years to come. The world owes it all to Carl, but but in retrospect, I just that was my favorite part of the story. Like, oh, now everybody <laughs> thinks the CIA has the super intense training because we two idiots just screwed up when we were playing around on our own time. That, anyway, so funny. that was uh, that was the agency. It was as I said, it was a really interesting experience for me. I really didn't do too much. It's kind of you to to talk about how I served my country. I wouldn't say I did all that much to serve it. I actually think I do more to serve it now by trying to be. Uh, uh, an outspoken uh, citizen with opinions about politics, but yeah. hopefully not uh, divisive opinions, or at least the, I try not to make the expressions divisive. Right. These days, I think a lot of what ails America isn't disagreement, it's disrespect. So I really work hard, especially on social media, which isn't very well uh, inherently geared up toward creating respect. I really try hard to approach potentially divisive topics in a respectful way and you know, you know, uh, and I, uh that's, that's my way of contributing i i to... absolutely i've read some of your, your on your i've quite first follow you on social media but i've also read some of the things you post on i think huffing post and a couple other places uh the in, i believe is the intercept or the independent you, you know a few things I've, I've followed you um and you always have something really intelligent to say and and backed up by logical suppositions you know um uh, I, uh, in, in it's, it's, you, you know, there's an expression, you get more, uh, flies with honey than vinegar. And yes. I, I think, you know, that that's a really smart way of, of bringing people over to, to Nessa, to maybe see your side and rather than, you know, name calling or something like that. But, you know, I'm not you as, know, I'm not as, uh, as tactful as you are. <laughs> <laughs> 
I've, now, seen, I've seen well, I've seen, I've seen some of your Facebook posts too, and I think you're trying to do it uh, the, your own way, something similar. I mean, for me, it's all about the heat to light ratio. Like, I want to shed light uh, as much as I can without unnecessarily shedding heat. And, and by the way, there are a lot of connections between all these things. One of, one of the advantages of getting older, I think, is that I start to see connections that I hadn't seen before, see, see patterns I hadn't seen before. So here's one. Like you said, the, the old expression about um, catching more flies with or bees or whatever it is with, with honey than with um, vinegar. So my, my primary goal <clears throat> is to persuade and I know, having had some experience with humans on Earth, no one has ever been persuaded by an insult, ever. It doesn't work. That We're not <laughs> wired that way. So if I'm trying to persuade someone, I have to get past their defenses, not engage them. Now, if, if my goal is something else, if it's just inherently masturbatory and I'm just trying to make myself feel good at someone else's expense, sure, I guess you could insult someone. But as I sometimes say, people who, who show up on my page – and uh, ostensibly discuss things, but really what they're doing is just a form of self-pleasure. I'm like, look, this is not about persuasion. This is about masturbation. There's nothing wrong with masturbation, but it's undignified to do it in public. And I'd rather if you wouldn't do it on my page. <laughs> if you want to be on my page, argue with intent to persuade. And one side effect I find of arguing with intent to persuade, of trying to be respectful to the people you disagree with, is that it gives you more of an opportunity to keep your own mind open. Because once your ego starts to engage because you've insulted someone, if it turns out that there's something you missed, you might have been wrong about some, something, it's really hard to climb down. All these lessons that I've been learning in the way I try to engage people in online discussion about potentially fraught political topics, they actually apply in self-defense too. I was just going to say it's the yeah. same in martial arts. Go it's ahead. the yeah, ego you know that stops you from learning. Right. Yeah. No, I didn't mean to interrupt. Please go ahead. That's no, no, please, exactly please. I mean, exactly it. It's just riffing on the same point. The worst martial arts I've met are also the ones with the most tremendous egos, and that does nothing to do with style. It's always. Yeah. And I'm right, and you're wrong. And, yes. you know, that, that being said, you know, like I, I told my student the other day, so he, he was doing something, and I said, look, I don't agree with what you did. Right. But I don't want you to stop doing it. What I want you to do is come back in a month and try to right. prove me wrong. And if you prove right. me wrong, I will be happy because it will mean yeah. I have learned something. Go yes. and yes. prove me wrong. And then if you can't, though, if you can't prove me wrong, these are the, my right. parameters. If you can't prove me wrong, then we'll, then we'll ban that. But, but play with it for a month or two months or however long you want and That's see beautiful. if you can answer that question. If you can, I will learn. And that happened to me with, you know, we're, yes. we're known as an arm triangle killer school. Like people understand that a radical, every one of our students, not everyone, but a lot of it have a really, really effective arm triangle choke. And my la fighter last he won with an arm triangle choke. One of the reasons is way back when I was teaching this white belt and his name was Mike, Mike mm. Naji. And shout out to Mike because I know he listens to podcasts. And I was showing a little detail of an arm triangle because he was having trouble. And I said, look, I'm not an arm triangle guy, but this is something I learned a long time ago from this, this purple belt I trained with who just trained with Hickson. I don't really do it this way, but maybe this will help. Right. Then, then he starts playing with it, playing with it. And you know, a few weeks later, he's like, hey, I'm going to do the arm triangle like this. And I'm like, I don't think that's right. <laughs> I showed you something, right. but I, I think you went off the reservation here. And then he right. does it to me, and I said, I'm going to shut up now. That is great. Yeah. And then I said, yeah. all right, we're going to stop doing it the old way. We're going to do it Mike's version. And Mike's, Mike actually happened to connect the dots to exactly the way awesome. uh, uh, some high-level guys, including Hicks and Grace, does it, um, which is very, very different. You know, Most people squeeze like crazy. I'm trying to, yeah. This is just super – Super like gentle pressure, and there was a, a fight where a long time uh, this is a while ago, maybe two years now or a year. And um, uh, Matt, what's that? The pretty boy who you know in in MMA, the 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 guy who's always the blonde hair and good looking, but he always loses. Uh, Sage. Sage, yes. So Sage was fighting this guy named uh, Bob Reyna, and and Bob Reyna tapped him with the arm triangle from 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 top half guard. So he's caught in the guy, and everybody's like, "Oh, Sage is such a you know a wimp because he tapped." I'm like, "No, they don't realize that he's doing because his instructor um, mm -hmm. from the lab." Um, learned it, that version that we now right. know, but I didn't know it exactly. Yeah. And what happened, my yeah. student as a white belt connected yeah. the dots, yeah. proved me wrong, and improved at so much. So now at, as our academy, it's part of our system, I had nothing to do with that, or very little to do with it. It had to do with a white belt student of mine who just had a very logical 
approach and, and a scientific approach to, to, to improving it to because he was having trouble and he problem solved and he yeah, improved. It's, it's, and then now, now it, it, it's uh, like I, I can tap people out with one hand and I, <laughs> I no, and I, and I do I'm it. with you. Yeah. No, yeah. this is, so yeah. this is, this is yeah. a great example. Yeah. Uh, and kudos to your student, obviously Mike, but kudos to you too, because if you were the kind of teacher whose ego was such, it's like, no, 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 no. I'm the teacher. I'm the expert. I'm the whatever fifth Don or whatever I am. And you're just, I have nothing to learn from you. I have nothing to learn in the world. I'm the expert that closes your mind. And when your ego engages like that, like, I'm not saying like ego should be eradicated. I think they're there for a reason, but, but you have to keep things in perspective too. Um, you want to keep an open mind to new information and not let your ego start calling the shots. So I try to do this when I'm having political conversations. If if there's something that happens in the world, this is back to the conversation about violence, like somebody is giving you some kind of a hard time, there are a lot of potential ways of dealing with it. Sure, one of them is violence, but it's funny. I'm no pacifist, but it is my observation of humans that violence and punishment uh, are their own reward for us as a species. We don't admit that. We tend to tell ourselves that we're engaging in violence solely as a, as a means but I don't believe that. I think a lot of time it's because it's its own end. And that makes us attracted to violence as a solution far more often than violence is actually an appropriate, a cost-effectively appropriate <clears throat> solution to whatever is the matter at hand. You guys have probably seen this. I might even, Renee, I might even have uh, discovered this from your Facebook page. But a year or so ago, I remember there was a a uh, video surface uh, uh, circulating on Facebook. It had, I don't know, 10 million views. And it was this guy, he's in his 60s, and a martial arts instructor. And it was billed as like the most important self-defense uh, advice that like, this will save your life. And so you think it's going to be like, oh, what is it? Some super <laughs> secret triangle or dim Mac, you know, yeah, right. uh, whatever it was going to be. And it was all just good social skills and yes. social engineering. Not not bad. I don't think. I know exactly the post you're talking, you know about. talking about. Yes, exactly. Yeah, like somebody yeah. starts woofing at you at a bar like, what the hell are you looking at? And the guy says, I'm sorry, my father died yes. last week. And, and you remind me a, a little of him. I apologize. And boom, done. Pattern break. Yeah. I mean, it's not impossible that you're going to deal with someone who still wants to have a go at you in a situation like that. But if he does, you've bought time. You've messed up his, his timing. Uh, you'll be able to respond more effectively with violence if that's called for. But much more likely, you just solve the problem exactly. with um, without having to put up your dukes and break out your you know your badass martial well, arts skills. And, and a lot What's of, wrong with that? Right. A lot of what we call self defense is not. It's ego defense, and it's yes. like the that's, scared oh little God, boy. Wait, 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 I just just right. say that again because right. that's if you don't mind. Right. Right. It's not self defense. It's ego defense. Right. Thank you. I'm, I'm totally going to steal that and. Put it in my books, right? But well, yes, I agree with you. No, and and actually, I have to say that it's not my quote. It's it's from a, a self defense expert by Coach Rodney King. It's not that Rodney King. It's he's a coach in South yeah. Africa, and he's like, yeah. look. You could easily walk away, but you choose not to because you have to be yes. the man or this. And that's so unhealthy. Yes. And it's your scared little inner child. You know, no, that's right. no. Or you want to look good in front of the girls. By definition, you are not defending yourself there. There's a much more effective thing you could, t could just, do to defend yourself and you're away. not doing it. That means you're defending something else. Right, right. And, and you know, Hicks and Gracie talks about this too because you think Hicks and Gracie is the man. He's like, you have to have your own code of honor. And make those rules. Now, if there's a situation where he says, I cannot stand this. Like he's like, if I saw a woman across the street and she's being abused, I yeah. cannot stand it. I must step in. But he's yeah. like, when you have that code, it, that code should not be narcissistic and just, you know, like that kind of thing. He talks about it. have your own code and make sure you abide by that code. But the code should not be this narcissistic, self-aggrandizing ego thing where you just want to pound people into the dirt. You know, then, then yes. you're, just, you're just the bully. You're the same bully as anybody else. You know, exactly. you just, yeah. you just want to perpetuate what that's was the, done that's to you to someone else. Lesson to learn. Yeah. yeah. But let's, let's take a little bit of hard pivot and let's talk about your awesome literary career. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I want to say how much I really appreciate. And this is, okay, this is what happened. I want to talk about this. So, okay. you know, we met in the Kodokan in 90, 92, 93. And 93. 93, 93. Yeah, 93, yeah. 93. And, um, and, um, you know, we had a great times. Then I, I, I stayed in Japan. I know you moved to Osaka, was it? Yeah, two yeah, years later, yeah, 1995. Yeah. yeah, and then in 98, unfortunately, I got hit by a car, so I was injured a little bit. I left Japan. And then I come back. I start training jiu-jitsu, and I have a friend, Christian. And Christian has this. He's like, man, I'm reading this amazing book. 
<laughs> is so cool because the fight scenes are so realistic. It's like what we do. It's not that bull crap, you know. And I'm like, what is it? And he's like, it's, it's, it's called Rainfall. And I'm like, Rainfall? What's that? And he's like, yeah, it's this book. It just came out. It's like, it came, it was like 2002, something like that. And, uh, uh, yeah, that's what came out. Yeah. And he's like, it's so freaking great. And then all through the jiu-jitsu community, I was like, you got to read this book. The guy's doing a triangle choke. He's doing this. And the main guy's a jiu-jitsu expert. We're like, oh, this is so great. And I'm like, oh. It's Barry. <laughs> That's my buddy. And then I'm like, I had this little thing. I said, you know, I know this guy. And they're like, oh, you're so full of shit. <laughs> you know, everyone's like, stop lying, Renee. You're full of shit. I'm like, no, no, I know this guy. And uh, and and I'm like, I like whatever, whatever. And then you know the ne- you know I just I started appreciating your work because what we have a podcast and and I think people might want to give it a listen is the 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 damage that cinema martial art or or entertainment yeah. martial art has done to our conception of what real violence looks like. Yes. And I really appreciate the verisimilitude of your books, how it stays, whether it's, it's um, you know, um, uh, you know, in the in the spy craft type thing that you yeah. you know I know you you draw on your experiences, so it's very real. I, of course, I can't comment on that, but I have some people who I've trained who said it's it's legit. You know, I, I can't comment, but but some people I trained with who I was teaching martial arts to, they have that background as you as operators, and they're like, this is this is legit because I asked. That's and then cool. I also know the martial art moves that John Rain does, and it's the one of your series. I know you have a number where there's the Livia Lone series. Um, I know right. you have the main character Docs and the, and Trevin and you know, all these different series which are weave into the the new and latest book. Um, but the the fight scenes are really that like that is how it's gonna go down. With maybe every now and again there's a little twist because obviously it's still entertainment, but it's very very real. And I I want to say personally I appreciate that because there's so much out there that is just junk. And you know I was watching anytime I watch a martial art movie I have to I have to prepare myself for generally disappointment <laughs> because right. I just I'm like ah. You know, and then every now and again, I'm surprised. I'm like, oh, that was that was really cool, and and that was that was legitimate. And I, I, you know, okay, that's how that's how it would look. And I say, um, I appreciate that, and it makes me enjoy your your novels so much. And and let's uh, let's just pivot to John Rain as a character and the the, the series. I know you changed the name; it's it's now a kill uh, a clean kill in Tokyo. But um, yeah, the when first I was book, yeah, I know, I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I hated all those titles that my first publisher picked out because the character's name is John Rain, and my publisher just was punning on that for the first four books. It was rainfall, hard rain, rainstorm, killing rain. It was silly. <laughs> Nobody could remember the titles. They had nothing to do with the stories. People would say to me, oh, uh, my favorite one is the the blue one. <laughs> and, and, and that's a really bad sign. Or a sign that you're, uh, it's a good sign, I guess, that people love the book, but it's a bad sign for the impact of the, the title. So uh, That reminds I, me of George R. Martin. They're like, yeah. I like the third one. I can't remember if it's a Clash of Kings or, you know. Uh, that's funny, you know what, because I love those books. But yeah. I got to think about it after you had a Game of Thrones, a Storm of Swords. But, yeah, yeah. I, I don't yeah. remember. But uh, but at least at least they weren't just using really lame uh, puns <laughs> one after the other. So, anyway, so my guy uh, – well, let, uh, let me say John Rain. So this is where John Rain came from. Uh, my wife, Laura, and I were, uh, as we've been talking about, we were living in Tokyo in 1993 to 94. And I was just, this is uh, after I'd left the CIA, but I did do, I don't know, nine months or so of Japanese language study when I was with the agency. So I spoke some Japanese, um, but I, by, by no means fluently. But I was very interested in the culture, and that's because of playing around with judo and karate when I was in college and just a general. And the more I, the more I read about Japan, the more the culture came to interest me. And, uh, and I'd always been mostly more, more interested in grappling than in striking arts, I would say. So I got into my head that I really wanted to train in judo at the Kodokan. I mean, anybody who's into grappling, especially if you're into judo, that's it. That's the, that's the Mecca of, uh, of judo. So, uh, Laura and I spent a year in Tokyo. I got a job. I took a leave of absence from my American law firm, and uh, we moved to Tokyo. I worked for a Japanese law firm for a year, and that's when you and I met each other, uh, training at the Kodokan uh, six days a week. It was awesome, So, including the Kangeko, the 10-day winter training. <laughs> and while we were out there, like all these things were just I, – I was, I was just so high on Tokyo. Everything about the Kodokan. I remember, I remember every night – Running up the stairs uh, from the from the, the changing room, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, and and running up to the dojo, running up the stairs to the dojo, and I felt like I was in a movie of my own life. That's how I felt like I was. I, 
I was beyond thrilled. I was like, I can't believe I'm at the Kodokan training in judo. It was ridiculous. So, and it wasn't just the Kodokan I felt that way about. We had Japanese friends who were taking us to to, uh, to jazz clubs and these great uh, coffee places and whiskey bars. And everything about the city was just so electrifying and interesting to me. It was really uh, metropolitan love at first sight. And all of that came together while I was out there. I've always liked writing and I've always had a knack for it. So I got this idea uh, for what ultimately became my character, this half Japanese, half American assassin whose specialty is making it look like natural causes. And in creating the character in his world, I drew on all the things that were so exciting to me at the time. He's got a judo background. He likes whiskey. He likes jazz. He likes great coffee. So I got to use all my favorite Tokyo locales, and I had him at the Kodokan. And that's where uh, that's where the character, the first book, came from. And since then, I've written. I just turned into my sixteenth book, and I've got three different series characters, and those and those worlds are now overlapping, and especially in the latest book, uh, the Killer Collective. But anyway, um, one of the things that just came naturally to me, even though I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this, but it seemed to be my default setting, is realism within whatever fictional world I was creating. And I said, there's no right or wrong answer to this. Uh, Eric Van Lusbader, the guy who uh, long he wrote the Ninja, yeah. uh, Shido Ninja, White, uh, White yeah. Ninja, those, all those novels, which I used to love when I was in college. Uh, he was interviewed once and someone said to him, have you ever been to Japan? And he said, I haven't actually, I don't want to go. I think it would, it would potentially interfere with the Japan of my imagination. And I have no problem with that answer. Just in fact, this is similar to if someone says, Oh, Barry, I do this or that martial art so that, um, it's a form of exercise. I wouldn't say what, that's not a valid reason to practice martial arts. I would say, that's fantastic. I mean, if you want to practice it a certain way, I would think to get your heart rate up to a certain degree or to build a certain amount of muscular and skeletal strength, not stuff I know a tremendous amount about, but, you know, reverse engineer from your objective. Eric Van Lusbader is telling kind of fantasies about the Orient. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. He's quite clear eyed about what he's doing and how he's going about it. But for me, I wanted something that was as real as I could make it. I didn't want to approach anything about Japan that was a cliche. It wasn't about geishas or sushi or anything like that. It was Japan as I as I encountered it with with open eyes and an open mind and open heart. And in all the fight sequences, I didn't want it to be martial arty. I wanted my guy to have exceptional martial arts expertise, which he does, primarily a judo background, but a lot of other martial arts too. But but I wanted to see how that expertise would express itself in real violence with the real unpredictability and messiness and chaos of violence. Now, two guys who don't have a clue pummeling each other looks very different than two guys with tremendous combat experience uh, and martial arts experience uh, going at it. That's just, that's going to look really different and feel different. So that's what I was trying to portray. And all the spy stuff, the surveillance, the counter surveillance, the operator tactics and mindset. I wanted to capture all, all of that, the headlines, the feel of the city. So that's a thing I, I just like to do. I don't, again, if, if I were talking to anyone who's trying to, uh, to finish a novel or get a novel published, publish a novel, uh, I wouldn't say, oh, you have to do it this way. That would be um, incorrect and narcissistic advice. I would say this is one way you can do it. It works for me, but you have to find what works for you. And something that's more fantastical, there's nothing wrong with that. But just be aware of what you're doing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't present, you know, balletic aerial kicks of one guy against six knife-wielding assassins, that kind of thing. I wouldn't present that as, as realistic. It can be lots of fun, especially on the screen, but but don't present it as realistic, especially because, yeah, as you say, the, it'll start giving people the wrong idea. Exactly. The problem is, like. you know, the power of cinema to to re, to make people think a certain way. It's 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 a. It, I mean, obviously, you know, it's not just cinema anymore. It's 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 internet. It's whatever social media, whatever whatever avenue of of access the is, is we're consuming. Uh, eventually we're consuming it, it will have an effect on how we view the world and and you know what I found in in the 80s where I came from a karate school that was really like like knocked down really hard and we were not doing like fancy stuff right 
And then right. as the as the 80s movies, and not just my school, I saw it in a lot of places. At 80s school, um, those those the movies came out with, you know, American Ninja or this or Karate right. Kid or whatever, right. and and or Van Damme and this, and whatever movie it was, or even just not martial art movies themselves, but the martial arts on TV changed. And and so suddenly people wanted to go to school with much flashier techniques. Yeah. And then if you didn't do that, you would yeah. you would have a and my old instructor had you know, I remember it was a time where I, I left to study for an exam that my parents wanted me to pass to go to a specialized high school and things like that. So I, you know, I, I, I had to take a little time off of training, a few months. I came back and I'm like, wow, this is really different. And suddenly we were not as hard as we used to be. We're doing a lot yeah. more kata and flashiness. And, yeah. and my instructor basically told me later, much later, is like, yeah, you know what? Um, couldn't pay the bills. You know, like had to, had to, yeah. had to, had to, yeah, you know, a challenge, know, change my teaching to suit the market. The market yeah. wasn't looking yeah. for what I was teaching, so I had to yeah. change. And you know, that was really a sad moment for me. And and yeah. and and obviously, with the advent of the UFC, it is the best thing that's ever done was say, well. If you actually want to learn something functional, right, this is the right. way you should train. And people are like, oh, it's not like in the movies. Right, and I love how right. how now you watch a Captain America or or Black Panther and and right. their their fantasy, but yet a lot of what they're doing are real moves. I remember Captain America and the Winter Soldier. He takes the guys back, traps his arm, puts on a rear naked choke. <laughs> right, and I'm right. like, yeah, there you go. And then Black Panther's <laughs> put, winding up a triangle choke with this, and and it's you know like it's like real stuff. Especially John Wick, and I know you're you're a fan of Keanu Reeves, and we were looking to have him you know do the uh, portray Rain at one point. But you know yeah. the John Wick movies. Obviously, there's a little fantastic element, but I'd say it's like 80 20. These are real moves. That's done, right. done in an, in a fun way that's entertaining, but they're also they're not on the the not on the edge of of in, in unbelievability. You know, exactly. like like okay, it's it's based on some reality ra- rather than Crouching Tiger, Hidden, Hidden Dragon, where it's, right. it's like okay, we're in fantasy land. You know, that's but right. I'll tell you, I legitimately had someone. This was way back. Crouching Tiger came out in '99, I think it was. Um, I legitimately had someone say, "Well, okay, the jumping on the trees is wrong, but all the other martial arts that do works." <laughs> and I'm like, "No, it doesn't." It's like, yeah, it does. That's and I'm like, no, it doesn't. That does not work. Yeah. Fights do not look like that. And he's yeah. like, what are you talking about? Of course they do. I'm like, no, no you don't. can't just. <laughs> like, the, the only caveat, the only thing I would a couple a couple things come to mind, which I I'll, I'll mention with great humility because I'm really. I wouldn't call myself an expert in much. I think I'm good at asking the right questions and and finding the right people to put them to. Uh, so to the extent I get violence right, meaning realistic in this case, in my novels, it's not because I have so much experience with violence myself, but rather I know uh, people who do have that experience who are really thoughtful about it. And it's been uh, uh, I've been in a fortunate position to be able to ask them questions and learn from them. But here's one thing, like. I mean, we can. I'm sure we can come up with things, you know, like master can level things that just would <laughs> not, it, like, it won't work. You can't, you know. There's, there's no universe. There's no universe in the entire multiverse where that's ever worked once in the history of infiniteness. Right. It's never worked. And, <laughs> and you know, you know, yeah, I'm it, sure it, there are things like that. But, but sometimes I've talked to people who are, are I mean, legitimate badass uh, survivors of a lot of encounters, and it's interesting how they will talk about a time when they did something they shouldn't have done. One guy I know who used to be, uh, his name is Lauren Christensen, lives in Portland, has written some terrific self-defense books, uh, karate background, used to be an army uh, MP. And he had a guy come up at him with a knife. And by the way, this is, you can tell this is a no BS story. Lauren's not trying to cover himself with glory. It's more he's horrified at what he did, but also interested in it in this, uh, in this productively analytical way. Anyway, he had someone come at him with a knife and he did this classic Aikido knife disarm where you, like, you grab the wrist and you, you press and you twist and you turn and the guy drops the knife. And he had unfortunately practiced that too much so that it became muscle memory. And under adrenalized stress, he did what he had trained to do. Uh, and it actually did work. But the pro- so the problem with that move in, in my very humble opinion, there are a lot of people who know more about this than I do, and if I and if I need to be corrected, I, uh, I'm, I'm totally open to that. But having talked to Lauren, I think the, the way to analyze this is to say it's not that a move like that cannot work in this plane of reality. It in fact did work for Lauren, but the percentage chances of success are so low Absolutely. that 
That's not a move you that you don't want that to be your right. go to move. Like if it worked for you, that's a great story. No, I, I, let me <laughs> but, let me uh, interrupt yeah. you. No, absolutely. It's, please, it's, please. There's no. We can see actually resurgence of some like taekwondo type stuff in MMA right, right. now, and you can see right. right, right you can right. see you can. There's no move that will never work, and there's no move that will always work, including that's a nice full point, yeah. locked in rear naked choke, which is a extremely. But let's look at the percentages here. What That's you right. want to do is base your core functionality on high percentage moves. And we, we can define that in a few ways. Leverage. Yes. Also, I like the jiu-jitsu version of like always it leads to a very strong plan B. And it doesn't yes. expose you to yes. like uh, polarizing outcomes. Like, okay, yes. if I miss this knight disarm, am I dead? Okay. Um, okay, I missed it, but now I'm still in a somewhat defensive posture. I can still live. So, yes. uh, you know, you base your foundation on high percentage functional basics and then out yes. of that you know you can you can you can actually every now and again there's a place for something a little bit more you know uh unorthodox there there are places for that uh in my sure. in, in one of my f students uh, he fought an mma fight recently and he actually did in a fight they double arm like almost like a hot ken punch <laughs> I mean, like I mean, it was like I was like, "What are you doing?" He's like, oh, "I was just showing off." Okay, all right, work good. Let's not do that again. <laughs> you know, but but he 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 knew he could pull it off because he was, you know, it was just at the moment he he just he did it. It was hilarious. It was really funny. But that is not he, he can do that because of his incredibly strong foundation rooted in basics yes. and fundamentals and high percentage moves. Yes. Um, you so know, this, it's it's so never this is, not. This is one of those yeah, good. interesting connection moments that I hadn't considered this before, but I have noticed from time to time that there's this thing, uh, at least among a lot of people where they want to, they're attracted to the exceptions and I don't know why. And I'll give you a couple of quick examples because really we we're just talking about one. Um, when I first got into martial arts, this was in college with Shitoryu karate. That's when I was like, three nights a week. I was going to the, to the gym. Uh, literally to the, the big gymnasium at Cornell. That's where the class was talking. There must have been 50 students in there. And so people would say, like, oh, you're taking karate. Um, what would you do if you were attacked by, you know, the proverbial 27 ninja? And yeah. I was like, well, what? Why are you – Why? or Barry, who would win between a karate master and a tai chi master? These are actual pretty – you've probably encountered this too. These oh, are fairly the common time. inquiries, right? Yeah. Oh, who would win Hulk versus yeah. Thor? You know, that's that's the world we're in, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> Which, and it's interesting. Why is that? It's funny. It works in the comic world. But mm -hmm. but for me, because my interest in martial arts was so uh, self-defense oriented, uh, I, my attitude and sometimes I would respond, I would say, I'm not saying it's, it's an interesting question from almost like a Hulk versus Thor standpoint. That's an interesting question, too. But. But why are we talking about that? Because the chances of my becoming a karate master are very small. And my chances of then facing a Tai Chi master <laughs> in combat, I mean, it's just probably not going to happen. So why are we talking about the thing that's not going to happen as, like, as somehow the basis for standing there? Likewise, if I'm surrounded by 27 ninjas and they're angry at me, I'll probably die. I probably <laughs> won't matter that I know some karate. You know? So that was one thing. That, that was my first acquaintance. With why are we talking about this? And then when I became a published novelist, People would come up to me fairly regularly after book signings, and the conversation would go something like this. They would say, I really want to get published. Can you tell me how to do that? And sometimes jokingly, I would say, all right, you ready for the secret? They'd be like, yeah. I'm like, you got to write this down. They go, okay. I say, you got to write the novel. <laughs> and then they'd say, ah, no, really, what do I need to do? <laughs> so I'd say, no, well, really, that's it. That's, if you don't do that, the, the rest of the magic won't happen, I promise. <laughs> and so they'd be like, and then it's always, the, okay, no, 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 assume I've written the novel, what do I need to do now? And I'd say, all right, look, if, if we can play this game. Like, because you really don't need to worry about anything else if, until you've written the novel, and you, and you probably shouldn't. But okay, so now you've written the novel. And at the time, this is before self-publishing and some of the new avenues for reaching a mass market of reader that have opened up. But at the time, the only route to that mass market was through a traditional publisher. So I would say, and, and the, not the only route, but the, the 99% route to a traditional publisher was with a traditional agent who agreed to represent you and your work. So I'd say, okay, when the manuscript is done, you want to find an agent. And there was this fairly regular question I would get at this point, which was, all right, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, do I really need an agent? And I'd say, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, I read about like Judith Guest, she wrote this book called Ordinary People, and she didn't have an agent. It went over the transom, and the publisher just published it, and then Robert, Robert Redford made the movie, and it won Academy Awards. And, uh, and I'd say, okay, 
Yes, that did happen. I think in 1974 or something like that. I forget exactly when. And if that's what you want, if that's what you want to play to, then go for it. Good luck. Uh, I've heard the same thing about now that we have different uh, ways of reaching a mass market of readers, which is typically the goal. Anyone who who wants to uh, uh, publish a novel commercially, you want to try to make a living from being a novelist. You got to have a certain number of people buying the book. That just that's just axiomatic. And then the question is, how do I reach those people? And I get these questions a lot because I played around with all the different. Uh, ways by which you can reach a mass market of readers. I've been traditionally published, I've self-published, and now I'm published by Amazon Publishing, which is a little bit of a hybrid. Anyway, so I get a fair number of questions about this. And people would say, what about Stephen King? Stephen King is this and that. And I would say, listen, if you think you're the next Stephen <laughs> King, then go for that. I mean, maybe you are. I don't know. But but let's acknowledge that Stephen King, he's not like a base hit. Yeah, he's right, not right. even a home run. <laughs> it's extremely exceptional. Right. And it's a weird thing to want to play to that exception. It's the same thing. It's like, well, Renee, you know, what if I, I once saw a guy do a, like a leaping, spinning capoeira or whatever and take out two guys? Why, why are you saying I can't do that? And I would say, hey, I'm not saying you can't do that. If you think you're that incredibly, like that genetically yeah. freakishly athletic guy who trained in capoeira for 20 years under, you know, it was his family system. He was in diapers and they're doing capoeira. He's got this, it's in, it's in his bones if you think you can do that too, then do it. Yeah. But if you're interested in something that's more likely to work more of the time for more people, then maybe we should be talking about something else. Exactly. That's all. You know, you know, that is, ex it's, you said something dr brilliant, but uh, Ryan Hall, who's a famous, he's a UFC competitor, but also famous shit guy. He's like, he's like, I hate the argument. I agree with him. I don't agree. But he said, I hate the argument of so the fight. And usually like when people make up a fight, Basically, what they want to do is, again, like you said, masturbatory. They want to make a situation with what you say doesn't work. So he's like, okay, I can, right. I can make <laughs> exactly, a situation. Exactly. I can make a situation where jiu-jitsu will always work, and I can also make up a situation where jiu-jitsu will never work. I can make up right. a situation where this works, and I can make up a situation. Right. And, and, you know, all of them are possible. You could get attacked by 27 inches. It's possible, <laughs> highly <laughs> unlikely, but it is no, possible. Not why I'm saying <laughs> Yeah, Yeah, I mean, okay, but where what are we going to do day to day? And the question okay. is, let's look at the data of what is most likely to occur and start there. And once we start yes. there, everybody's like, but this is boring. I like the ninja scenario better. I'm not telling you not to. Train exactly, to right. You know, but you, you, By the <laughs> way, the, the 27 ninjas example is courtesy of uh, one of the pioneers in reality-based self-defense, a guy named Mark McYoung, who's got a website called No Nonsense Self. I was, I was just going to ask you to mention him because I, I yeah. know you're very close with him. So anyway, go ahead. He's, well, I discovered Mark in 1989 with his first book called Cheap Shots, Ambushes, and Other Lessons. S to this day, one of the best. The best. Uh, yeah, it's one of the best books and, and weirdly hilarious books I've ever read on, on self-defense. It just got Not republished, on... I believe. He just had he just republished it and like put yes. a new cover on it or something. All, yeah, all of, all of his books. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad to say because the, they're such a great they're resource. Great. They're great. But he great. he talks about the you know the 27 ninja mindset. He calls them what if monkeys because they're just people. <laughs> they just like no matter what. It's like well what if what if you were surrounded by a battalion of marines? What if you know it's funny. I used to do this with a friend of mine. I was just reminiscing about this with one of my college buddies. Um, four of us lived together and we're still oh, extremely close to this day. And these guys are I'm, I'm so blessed to have them in my life. Anyway. Uh, Two of us were a little bit blow offs, and two were hardcore pre med guys. Evan and Pete were the hardcore pre med guys. And Evan uh, knew, he knew everything about animals. He'd, he'd spent summers working at the vet, and he was just, he was one of these kids who was always in the library reading about animals and science and all that stuff. So Danny and I, the, the blow off, half of the crowd we used to try to get him to answer all our stupid hulk versus thor type animal questions <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and one of them the classic was once we're like evan who would win between a tiger and a lion and evan hated those questions and he would say this is exactly how the conversation would go evan was evan who would win between a tiger and a lion i don't know what you're talking about a tiger and a lion would never meet up a lion is a creature of the african savannah uh, the tiger lives in the indian subcontinent they would never encounter each other Okay, what if you, you did like a trip and you captured a lion and you captured a tiger and you put them in a cage together? Then who would win? And would say, they wouldn't even know what to make of each other. They would have no 
recognition of each other, they would just ignore each other. Okay, okay, what if you what if you injected them with amphetamines and starved them down? At, like, literally, the conversation was just that childish and ridiculous. And Mark now has he calls what we were doing to Evan, well, albeit we were doing it mostly just to make him insane but there are people who really do this he calls yeah. them what if monkeys they'll just keep asking you what if it's extraterrestrials what if they have laser beams shooting out of their <laughs> eyes what if they have psychokinetic powers i don't know it's the strangest yeah. human impulse but i don't know where you know you know you, you know you're absolutely right and and uh I, it's the bane of every martial arts instructor is the mm -hmm. what if what if now that being said i i actually encourage students to ask questions on the mat because i of think course. problem solving is important but the what if he what if he does that then then I like you to solve the problem, yeah. not me necessarily just tell you. Right. So that's the difference. It's like okay, your opponent is in you know the I have you the Kimura locked in, but he's exploding yeah. out with all his force here. Well, what are right. you going to do? And if you can't right. solve that problem, I'll help you along the way. And 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 that's the difference the is because I put the onus on you right. to problem solve in the moment using your training and your foundation of skill. That the day in day out from the grind, not friend, that is, that not is part talking of on a, a line teacher. and just yeah. making these mental notes. And and I'm not knocking any style, but I would say kung fu guys are generally the ones who do this the most. American, not Asian. I'm talking American guys who study kung fu. Mm. Um, they're the ones who are like kind of the worst at this. Not I don't know why that is. Yeah. In my personal, I'm not saying this is across the board, but in my personal experience, the what if monkeys are very common on on that side of the fence or the insane reality-based self-defense guy who actually doesn't train. <laughs> you, yes. know, you know what I'm talking about? Like he's like, well, you know, jujitsu is never going to work because I, yeah, I, I have 45. No, or no, no, you know, no. it's like those two, those two poles of like a guy came into me and he'd read read a little too much. Um, you know, um, uh, of uh, shoot, which book was it again? It's um, you know, uh, he's like, you know, I forgot which book they talk about. Guys, like, I want to make myself hard to kill. He's like, you know, I want to make myself hard to kill, and I want to uh, against um, antisocial, uh, uh, asocial violence, which is the term that I yeah, somewhat yeah. disagree with because it's it's problematic. It's rooted in a lot of understanding of crime that is now outdated and super criminal ideas and things like. But just like, okay, I want to make myself hard to get kill against asocial predatory violence. I'm like, okay, okay, let's go train. You know, halfway through, he's like, stops drilling, and I'm like. Okay then. <laughs> right. Obviously, you right. don't want to make yourself hard to grill, kill because y the grind is, you know, like you just got tapped out eight hundred times. It's hard and, to work. Right. Yeah, and you just make an excuse because oh, I would just bite him here. I just think, I'm like, okay, we're done. <laughs> now, now, what I usually do with those guys because we actually had a guy visit the other day, but I said, yeah. okay, let's put on the goggles. And I did this with the RBSD guys who came in. They went on being my students. They're actually good guys. But I said, yeah. okay, we'll put the goggles on now. We'll actually full on spar. And right. you can poke your thumb in my eye as much as you want. Just pucker the goggle. If you do that, we'll call it a win. If you put your right. teeth on any fleshy part of my body right. and you can right. and, and you can growl three three for two seconds and right. hold it there, we'll call that a win. We'll just call it a win. Not even if it wasn't exactly a win. Right. And right. you know what? Everything I learned in jiu-jitsu worked all the time anyway. And judo. <laughs> and, and it's like it doesn't matter. You know, like yeah. it's just it's just silly. Silliness, because once you spar it out, you see that the fallacy of those arguments, because yes. you're putting the real work in, you're not doing yes. this exact, I like your term, mental masturbation. You're just not doing this online, this mental, you know, like, um, you know, like a thought experiment. No, let's put the right. thought experiment aside. Let's actually do it. You know, and exactly. it, it's the grind that teaches you. Uh, 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 Carlos Machado said, there's no magic without sparring. There's no uh, magic without sparring. And that's it. That's it. End of story. You don't get good unless you put the grind in. But um, I, you, you, there was some – that was a really funny story. Um, I know you have this, the new book coming out. I would like to talk about that. Um, it, is, it, is, it is amazing. There's, it's, it's there's, a, a famous, there's a famous uh, martial arts and self-defense de instructor mentioned in the book. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> please, please go on. <laughs> Well, I, uh, that was that was a really nice exchange. So, uh, as you know, but as uh, your listeners probably don't, uh, what were we in touch with? I can't even remember something on Facebook just a few weeks ago when we when we talked about doing this podcast together, and I can't even remember what we, what the impetus was. But by coincidence, uh, just a few weeks earlier, I had finished the new manuscript which is called All the Devils. All the Devils is Olivia Lone novel. 
Abia is one of my. She's my most recent series character. Uh, All the Devils is the fourth Livia and book. Super, Livia alone, super cool female protagonist, and it's so empowering to see a female protagonist that has come from trauma but overcome it. I, I find her really inspiring, and uh, and and awesome. Thank you. Love her. So uh, she's a Seattle sex crimes detective who's not just investigating sex crimes, but um, avenging them. She and her little sister were trafficked from Thailand when Livia was 13, trafficked to America. And she said Livia overcame uh, tremendous uh, tragedy and trauma and rebuilt herself not, you know, with scars, but uh, she's fundamentally a protector. And that's what motivates her. When jiu-jitsu was, well, wrestling and jiu-jitsu were uh, her first experience of empowerment when she was a teenager. And she took, uh, she took that, that sort of uh, training seriously and took it far. So Livia is um, a judo, jiu-jitsu, and wrestling expert. That's, that's her thing, and she's, she's awesome. But uh, <clears throat> in the, the new book, there's... Uh, an element of the plot where Livia is tracking some people, uh, they are military and as part of their military training there, they are able to request various forms of esoteric civilian training. This stuff is all real. I get this direct from uh, a friend of mine who I think in all the acknowledgements of the book, his name is Mike Kilman. He's one of my sources for things like I said, if, if I'm if I'm good at something, it's mostly asking good questions and uh, being fortunate to know the right people to ask them of. But anyway, Mike was telling me about this kind of training where yeah, you put together a good proposal and you can get all kinds of training: mule pack stuff, rock climbing, martial arts, self defense, shooting, driving courses. Special forces guys get this kind of training all the time. Well, my two guys, my two bad guys. Our special forces guys and Olivia doesn't know who she's after, but as she as she's starting to put it together, she uh, is looking into these guys and she gets she gets a list of various kinds of training they've gotten and she's trying to correlate those uh, places and dates of their training with certain crimes that have been committed. Um, one of the and so the, her contact, a, a guy named Fallon in the military, who's feeding this information, mentions that at one point they were in New York training with a guy named Rene Dreyfus, uh, <laughs> Dreyfus at uh, Radical Mixed Martial Arts Academy. And, and it's just, it's not a huge moment, but Livia just says she knows So you're saying Rene. I she, train bad guys. But it's like, I hope you don't mind because it's not your fault. It's like, if you're a, uh, it's a funny thing. It's funny that you make that joke, but there are people in the world who are, unfortunately, and I think about this stuff when I write novels, it won't be so much in jest. Yeah. And like, and my response is, well, what if they, what if they bought a Ford Tour? to commit a robbery is the yeah. is the car dealer liable in some way i mean you know you've got if you as a martial arts instructor have two serious students they're both special forces guys and they train with you you don't you don't you can't inquire into even if you did inquire into every aspect you could of their lives uh the bad parts are secret there's yeah, no, no evidence sure. no so whatever you know you train these guys uh just like the ford tourist dealer um you know sold them a car and the mcdonald's guy sold them a burger i mean like this is just the way the world works but anyway but more importantly when fallon mentions to livia that they've trained with dreyfus livia uh thinks to herself oh that's you know that's a guy she's, she's good he's one of the ones she she's rolled with so well, that well, was it you. but it was just my shout out and then, <laughs> and, then, and then in the author's notes i have a link to you and oh you Radical. do Oh, well, thank you. I, of course, man. Are you kidding? <laughs> this, That's awesome. You are, I, it's been my privilege to train with some some pretty awesome people, Half Gracie in California, and um, uh, I rolled at Henzo's Academy in New York uh, a few times years ago, and this before you and I reconnected, and uh, a lot of private instructors, and you are just um, – I, I don't want to embarrass you, but dude, you are one of the best teachers I've ever encountered. Oh, it's in everything, in your attitude, your approach, even anecdotally, what you just said when someone's like, Renee, what if, like, you know, what if the guy got him in a chemo, but he's trying to explode out? It's like, look, I could give you at least, if not the answer, then an answer, but you'll do yourself more good working out the answer yourself to the extent you can, and I'll guide you to the extent you need it. And then someone learns not just the answer, but also how to learn an approach that the person can, she can use for herself. Uh, that to me, that's just, that's great teaching. And you just do that. I don't know how much of that you figured out and how much is instinctual, but it really shows in the, in the, on the mat. Well, I had 
a great guy to inspire me way back when in 1993. And I, I can't, uh, I, <laughs> no, so no, you know, it's true. Nice. It's really true. You, um, you changed my life and, uh, I, I, um, I'm indebted to you and I, I didn't even know what to say. I'm, I, I don't want to say, just say thank you. And, and yeah, I'm just going to shut up. <laughs> it's really, I'm kind of broken up here actually. Oh man. Well, well, thank you. Um, again, I don't want to turn this into too much of a mutual admiration podcast, but, uh, Renee, what you've done with, with, your life is, is just hugely inspirational. I mean, I can't believe there was a time that I knew more about grappling than than you did. It's ridiculous to even contemplate that because you have, it, it's like I was, I don't know, I was at 100 feet and you were at 10 feet and now you're in the stratosphere and it's just, it's beautiful. It's uh, it's really inspirational. I'm so happy for you. I, I don't I'm know about that. For my, but for I, your students. Thank you. I don't, I don't know about that, but um, you know, uh, it's because you're yeah. it's your it's because you're naturally humble and and think of yourself as uh, forever a student, which I think at least to some extent everybody should uh, should think then you're open to new learning and will never have learned everything. But really, um, it was just such a pleasure to roll with you um, at your place. And you're, you're you're like, I mean, the way I used to look at Steve Blower when we were training with him, that's what you've become now. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. He is he's he's amazing, and I, he does listen too sometimes. So he's going to get a kick out that we uh, laughed him. Can he's I, gonna, can I, in that case, I'm going to tell a very quick Stephen Blower. Go ahead, it, yeah, it's really quick. Go ahead, please. So this is so we knew so Steve we we knew each other at first in '93, '94, and then <clears throat> I was um, back in Tokyo visiting from Osaka. Maybe this would have been sometime between '95 and '96, and uh, at the Kodokan. So I'm rolling around with. Steve again. Steve's had a lot of knee injuries, as you know. So you got to be really careful. He's, he's got like those whole exoskeleton things on his knees, and he's got to be really careful. So I said to him, "Listen, when when I first met you, you were, if I'm remembering correctly, you were third dawn, and your judo was already so elegant and so powerful. And by elegant, by the way, I don't. I mean it was pretty, but that's not really what I mean. Elegant, like efficient. Mm-hmm. He never did more than what was necessary. It was beautiful, just beautiful to watch or to be on the other end of." Anyway, so I said, but okay, so now it's been a while, and what do you do? Your knees are still bothering you, you're getting older, and that kind of thing. He said, yeah, you know, I can't do all the things I used to do, but what I find I'm able to do now is I've been doing this so long that when I go with these young guys, really strong guys, aggressive guys, I know what they're going to do a second before they do it, and then I just move a little bit so they can't do that thing they were going to do. <laughs> and I don't know why that they can't do the thing they were going to do. And I just do it again, and then they can't do that thing they were going to do. And I do that a few times, and they start to get frustrated, and they try too hard, and they expose themselves, and then I throw them. <laughs> and, and I just thought, oh, my, that's like sun new level yeah. strategy. He's almost fighting without fighting. He just – it's almost magic. It's supernatural. No. They don't – these people who are really good. I mean these are black belt, second, third, dawn, really young, strong, fast. And they don't even understand why all their best weapons are not working against this guy. He's not really doing anything. He's just standing and he's, there. And Steve is not big works. at all. Steve is not a big hulking guy. He's a skinny, no, old – No, you yeah, never know British it. Dude, exactly. Yeah. So I used that at, um, in the opening of, uh, of my – I think it was – is my rain prequel graveyard of memories where rain is talking about the evolution of his own ju- judo and how back when he was young, it was all like, uh, you know, an yeah. aggression and stuff. And as he got older, he just, he gradually learned that he could be much more efficient because he was able once, once you're able to anticipate mm-hmm. what the other person is going to do, you, you have all the options in the world. And that's what the highest level of judo strategy, probably any strategy, um, is and Steve Blower really embodied that for me. I, I think you're you're at that level now yourself. Thank you. I, I I love Steve except for the time he put me in a triangle and kept farting on my face. <laughs> 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 on purpose. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Well, that's, one, well, that's one way to learn. That yeah. You know <laughs> He's like, I ate Mexican yesterday. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's my experience with my master Steve. So. Uh, um, but uh, 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 Matt, uh, do you have any questions? I'm you, you kind of listening. I've here. just been a, a an eager listener. It's been uh, nice to hear the stories and the, hear the the backstory of Renee's journey as well. After I've gotten to know Renee over the the last year or so, it's been it's been a treat just to be a listener and a passive uh, guy in the back seat listening. So uh, thank, uh, thank you so much for for being part of the sh- the show. Thank you uh, both would, for having me on, Matt. We, thanks for thanks for getting it all set up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think what we would like to. Um, for anybody listening, we'd like to give away a copy of your book, 
the Killer Collective uh, to anybody that listens to the show and also uh, will uh, share something on social media. Yeah, I've well, already bought one, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'd, be to send, I'd be happy to send a copy. Uh, I don't know how, the, how no, this works. I, I no, already, I already have a couple that I'm giving out in the Academy, so I have a few. I have a few that I've already I, I, bought, I, I, so don't I, even I, worry I, about I, that. It's uh, But, um, but yeah, anybody who listens, and what do you say, Matt? Uh, goes, uh, they listen and comment on our uh, share the show share yes. the share this episode yeah tag us and then you'll we'll be putting you in uh in, in the hat and we'll pull a name and we'll give a, a copy of the book fantastic uh, or or share or write a review on itunes true yeah the best how about this the, the best share or the best itunes review we'll pick it should and we then... ask for both are we gonna be greedy here <laughs> we're greedy it's a good no, it's gonna, a great book i mean i'm gonna leave an itunes i'm gonna leave an itunes review but i won't be eligible for the prize okay uh <laughs> barry where can anybody uh it's, it's killer collective on amazon but where can anybody find uh you and your uh uh novels w- would you would you recommend they start with killer collective or you recommend them they start with the rain novels well like I like to say you can read them in any order you like as long as you read them all. <laughs> you, you really can read them in any order you like. Uh, I, I write – there is an arc to the character, but <clears throat> every one of the novels I've written is designed to function as a standalone. And even though The Killer Collective actually brings all three of my series together, many of the Amazon customer reviews – this is gratifying because there's a lot, a lot of technique that goes into – making something work both as a series entry and as a standalone. A lot of these people are saying, oh my God, have I not heard about this guy before? I read this book, I loved it, and then I realized that he's got series, and this is um, these characters, are they have their own stories, like the, um, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like the Avengers, and, uh, but they're also individual movies. So I've gone back and read all his books, but I, but I had no idea. It just works seamlessly. That's really gratifying. So that's a long way of saying... Uh, yeah, you can definitely start with The Killer Collective. It's a really fun book. <clears throat> or you can read any of the other books. Anyone who wants to find out more, I'm easy to find online, barryeisler.com, B-A-R-R-Y-E-I-S-L-E-R. I'm on Facebook, again, Twitter. You can find me pretty much anywhere. And on my on my webpage, there's a, there's a subpage called Works with a rundown on all the novels, what's the order, who's who. But again... You could pick one up at random, and you're you're guaranteed to find realistic action, compelling characters, exotic locations, a certain degree of steamy sex, all the good stuff that makes political thrillers so uh, fun and worth reading. Fantastic! Thank you so much for being on today. It was just, I can't even tell you how just wonderful it was, and uh, appreciate <laughs> okay. taking the time. And uh, I I look forward to hopefully increasing people understand that you're just a wonderful, amazing, really entertaining uh, an author and. Uh, you know, hopefully we can connect again soon. Where my wife and I are planning to a train cation, so we're going to go out to California. Hopefully, we can come up and, and visit you. We would love that. Please keep me posted. Fantastic. Thanks okay. so much again. Thank you. Great Come talking on. to you both. Thanks for having me on the show. It was, it was a real pleasure. Thank you.